Our God is relational and there was love in the Godhead even before creation. However, we as human beings are broken in our capacity to love and to be loved. In this message, we also address several wrong postures that could hinder us from experiencing the love of our Heavenly Father. Starting this morning, uh, over the next six Sundays actually, we are going to spend time just examining God's word on this topic, the Father's love. The Father's love. Now, we did this last year separately at the men's conference and the women's conference. So those of you who attended either the men's conference or the women's conference, you would have heard some of this uh, last year. Uh, we were just waiting for an opportunity to do this uh, in our Sunday service so that uh, everyone can uh, receive this message, receive it in their hearts and their lives and be built up uh, uh, and understand God's word concerning the Father's love. Now, uh, just as, as introduction, you know, very often our understanding of God is uh, tainted with several things. Sometimes it's been tainted by our own experiences. Now we go through some experience and therefore we formulate a certain opinion about God. Or this is who God is. And it may or may not be right. It may not necessarily align itself to the word of God. The idea that we have about God. Sometimes our perception of God may be formulated with the help of other preachers. Uh, unfortunately, it could be wrong theology. And, and, uh, and uh, you know, but because we accept that. Uh, our picture of God is somewhat tainted, it's somewhat inaccurate. And, um, and uh, you know, our revelation of God affects our relationship with God. Because if you think God to be someone mean and bad and angry, and you'll always be praying and asking for forgiveness. You know? <laughs> Every prayer you start, oh God, forgive me, oh God. Because that's your picture of God, that God is somebody mean and angry. And uh, he remembers all the sins you did up until that moment. He's never forgotten. He never let go. So uh, your, our revelation of God affects our relationship with God. So it's so important to have an accurate picture of God, a true picture of God. Try to understand or see God the way he is revealed to us in the word of God. And not only that, not only does our relationship with God affect our, not only does our revelation of God affect our relationship with God, but our relationship, our relationship with God also affects how we perceive ourselves and also how we relate to other people. So if you come to that understanding that you are loved by God, then you will also be able to love yourself. And then you'll also be able to love other people. If you come to the understanding that you are valued by God, then you'll also be able to value yourself. Hey, if God values you, something good in you. <laughs> something good about you. So you're able to value yourself. And then you're able to value other people. You see worth in other people. So our revelation of God affects our relationship with God. Therefore affects our own relationship with ourselves. And also our relationship with other people. You're with me so far? So this is very important. To get a right picture of God. And our love for God deepens as we understand how much He loved us. How much God loved me. Then you begin to love Him more because of that. You know, the Bible tells us we love Him because He first loved us. We're just only reciprocating the love that He has for us. You know, Jesus said, we'll look at it later. Uh, to whom much is forgiven, he, the person who, who's been forgiven a lot, He loves a lot. Because He understands how much. He's forgiven. So he loves back. Reciprocates that love to God. So what we're going to do 
uh, over the next six weeks is build on this little by little. So each, each Sunday, we'll keep adding to this whole message on the Father's love. Ultimately, we want all of us to be in a place where we recognize His love, where we experience the Father's love. So we're not looking at a theological understanding, but we're looking at an experiential understanding. That means you need to experience the love of God. It didn't say, oh, study the Bible and see that God is good. It says, oh, taste and see. It's good to study the Bible, but you need to taste. It's good to read the menu, but you've got to eat the food. <laughs> oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. So that's what we're after. That as we study the word, of course, uh, we want each one experience, personal experience, taste and see the Father's love. And then they, all these other things will happen. You'll begin to uh, love yourself and be able to uh, relate to others. And, and as for those of you who are parents or those who are going to become parents, you know, this whole message becomes a framework even for parenting. That is, you use God as reference. If God is like this, let me try to be like that as a parent. So that's, again, uh, a, a very important thing. I'm not saying we will match up to his standards, but at least use his reference and pray. Say, God, let me grow up into that. If you're the father like that, I want to be that. So let's begin. When the Lord Jesus spoke to us, he often used the term father to refer to God. Father. We know one of the best well-known places is in the Lord's Prayer itself. He starts, our father who is in heaven. God is our Father. God who is in heaven. He is our Father. Our Father who is, who is in heaven. So he, say, he wants us to uh, look at God as Father. Do you look at God as your Father. The other aspect about God is that He is a God of love. We know that. First John 4 verse 8. God is love. So God's love. God's love, the Bible portrays this to us and we will see it in the weeks to come. God's love is unlimited, it's infinite, it's unconditional. God's love. Unlimited, infinite, unconditional. God is love. So this is Father. God is Father who loves us. So I'll be talking about the Father's love for us. The Father's love for you. We'll be talking about that over the next six weeks. So we must understand that, first of all, God is a relational God. God is a relational God. And it's interesting in John 17, verse 24, Jesus is praying his high priestly prayer. He says, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. So the first part is saying, Father, I want all these people, I want them to see me in the glory. I want them to be with me. I want them to see me in the glory. So one day you and I will get to see Jesus in his glory. But the latter part of that same verse, he's saying, Father, for you loved me even before the foundation of the world. So that means before any creation came into existence, love was happening. Love was in the air, in heaven, between the Godheads. Sorry if you think it is sacrilegious for me to joke about it. Just, just okay. <laughs> but there was love. You loved me. Father, you loved me. Even before the foundation of the world, there was love happening in the Trinity. The Trinity, it, 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 some put it like this, they say it's a holy community, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It's a community. There is relationship, there is love in the Trinity. Father, you love me even before the foundation of the world. So think about this. God is relational, which means God loves and he can be loved. 
He he doesn't need love for his existence, but he can be loved. Just think about it. God is relational. He loves and he can be loved. That means when you love him, he feels it. You never thought about that, right? Because he's relational. When you love him, he feels it. He enjoys it. He receives it. Again, for lack of better example, if you ever fell in love, you know that, that, that period of time when you were in love, you were on cloud 11. <laughs> because you felt loved. <laughs> you felt you received love. These wires here. Well, that's just maybe a poor example, but the point is God feels love. He not only loves, but He receives love. He can be loved. That's why Jesus gave us this commandment, you know, in Mark 12 29 to 31. What's the first commandment? You will love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You love Him. Now, if you love an inanimate thing, that thing can't feel your love. I love my phone. Sorry, the phone doesn't feel your love. (laughs) I love my car. The car doesn't feel your love. But God feels it. Otherwise, there would be no point in us loving God. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and Strength. So God actually feels, experiences your love. So when you look up to God and say, Father, I love you. Or Jesus, I love you. He receives it. He feels it. He's relational. He loves and he can be loved. So extending that thought to you and me, is that we are created in the image of God, which means we are also created to love and be loved. We're also created that way. To love and be loved. So we too can give love, we too can receive love, we experience love. The second thing that I want to bring attention to as we build on this And this is so amazing that God has made us the focus of his unconditional, unlimited love. He's made us the focus. And look at Ephesians chapter 1 verses 4 and 5 and I'll read it for the message Bible because it just puts it so well. Ephesians 1 verses 4 and 5 in the message Bible Long before he laid down earth's foundations, that is even before creation, he had us in mind and settled on us as the focus of his love to be made whole and holy by his love. Long before creation. He had us in mind. That's because God saw through time. He had us in mind, even before creation. And he made us the focus of his love. I mean, he said like, this God who is love, this Father who is love, says, I'm going to put all my love on people, on these people. Focus of his love. So let's say this together. I am the focus of his love. The Bible says that. And he did this even before you were born. Even before you were born, you were loved by God. Because he had you in his mind. It's too late to change it now. He made us the focus of his love. And that love transforms us. It makes us whole and holy before him. 
And along with that, verse 5, long, long ago, he decided to adopt us into his family. Come, I have planned, decided you're going to be my son and daughter. God will be, he will be our father to us. Long ago, he decided, that's what I want to do. I'm going to make them my sons and daughters. I'm going to be their father. And as a father, I'm going to focus my love on them. And my love is going to make them whole and holy. And it's all planned ahead of time. Before time. So it says here, what pleasure he took in planning this. So, there was love even before creation. And there was creation because of love. So why did God create you? Because he wanted to make you the object of his love. Not the puppy, not the cat. <laughs> but you and I, people, we become the focus of his love. So he created us. So think about it. In all of creation, God is saying, you are the focus of my love. People, his people, his sons and daughters, you're the focus of my love. So, here's the problem, but our capacity to love and be loved is broken. Our capacity to receive love and give love is broken. So although God is Father, God is infinite, unlimited, unconditional in His love on the receiving side. There's brokenness. So there's no problem with God's side. But on our side, we are broken. So you tell somebody, for God so loved the world. God loved you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't compute, doesn't get in, doesn't make, doesn't matter in some cases. They don't. So if we really want to experience the Father's love, and if we really want to be able to rest in that love, abide in that love, live out of that love, first thing, we need to receive wholeness for our brokenness. Amen? Receive wholeness to our capacity to receive love and give love. So what we want to do this morning is just talk about that. Just I uh, want to put before us seven wrong postures. By wrong postures, we mean wrong mindsets, wrong thinking patterns that actually uh, limit us from experiencing the Father's love. And then... We'll take some time to pray and ask God to address those things in our lives so that we can prepare ourselves to receive that unconditional, infinite, unlimited love of God, which he has for us. He, he wants us to receive it. So what are some of the wrong postures? When I say wrong postures, I mean wrong mindsets, or wrong thought patterns. Like we said in the very beginning, uh, our, 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 our perception of God is marred. It's flawed. And therefore, it hinders us from receiving his love. So what are some of the wrong postures? Number one is what we would call, again, these are just made up for, you know, so that we can do a Sunday sermon. Uh, so seven points, okay? Don't go and say there are seven points in the Bible. You know, <laughs> this is just for teaching, right? For communication. Right? So we've broken it up like that. So the first one is what we will call as a prodigal mindset. See, we're all... We were all prodigals at one point. We all started like that. That was our life in the past. But, you know, at some point we came to our senses. We went to the Father. We went to God. And we did what the prodigal son did in Luke 15, 19. He came to his father. He said, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired Okay, that was a good step. It's a very positive step. And we all have 
hopefully it may have taken that step at some point where we realized we were wrong. We've turned to God. We said, God, I, I am not with I have sinned against you. I've, I messed up. And like the prodigal son, we came to, to the father and we said, you know, I'm not worthy to be called your son. But what did the father do? He said, bring out the robe. Bring out the ring. You know, let's celebrate. He didn't want this prodigal to remain a prodigal in his house. No, you are my son. I'll treat you like that. Treat you like a prince. So here's the problem. We've come to God. He's clothed us. He's put a ring on our finger. He's celebrated us. But we still go around with a prodigal mind. I am not worthy to be a son. I'm not worthy to be a son. Do you think that makes the father happy? No. Does it? Yes, at one point we did come to our senses. But after that, we have to embrace what the father has done for us. And, and accept that we are Sons of God, the daughters of God. But if we continue with that prodigal mindset, it hinders our ability to enjoy the Father's love. Like Jesus said in Luke 7, 47, you know, uh, he's talking about this woman whose sins were forgiven. He says, I, I say to you, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. To whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Or when you have been forgiven, so much. You just love him back so much. That's what God wants. Accept that forgiveness and just pour out your love to him. Thankfulness. That's what he wants. So those with a prodigal mindset, if we may keep that, hold on to that, we find it very difficult to comprehend God as a loving, forgiving father. That he's actually forgiven you. You're a son or daughter. So get rid of that prodigal mindset. Get rid of it. Yeah, at one point we made that change. But now see yourself. As a son or a daughter of God. Not. You're not God's prodigal forever and ever. Amen. That story is over. Amen. Today. He's embraced you as his son. As his daughter. Second wrong posture. Is the slave. A slave mentality. If you will. They feel like. Oh. I have to earn everything. And I feel, un they feel unfit for bigger things. They don't feel disqualified. Now just think about it. You know, many of us have people who work in our homes to help us. How do they think? I work and I earn. So I get what I've worked for. At least most of them. Or that's how it is. But they don't see themselves qualified for anything more. No. Unless you elevate them. So you come and sit on the chair. No, no, no. I'll sit on the ground. Why? They don't feel qualified to sit on the chair. Have you all noticed it? Or I'm the only one who's... <laughs> you're all looking at me like this doesn't happen. <laughs> it's very strange. It's a slave mindset. And we carry that in our relationship with God. I only get what I've worked for. Anything beyond it is not for me. Right? So if I prayed today and came to church, maybe I'll get healed. If I don't get healed, it's because I didn't get, I didn't pray. Barter system with God, right? <laughs> but that's a slave mindset. The slave doesn't understand grace. And you'll see many of these postures. Uh, uh, grace is so difficult to be understood. So someone with a slave mindset uh, uh, um, doesn't enjoy this or doesn't understand this concept of the fact that we are sons and daughters. We have an inheritance. We are joint heirs. We are heirs with God. No, it's very hard to grasp. that. So we need to get rid of that. You're not a slave. God didn't save you to make you a slave. He saved you to make you a son and a daughter. 
look at these, this Romans 8.15. I'll just read it to you from uh, two cont- uh, one contemporary English version and then another version here. It says, God's spirit does not make us slaves who are afraid of him. Instead, we become his children and call him our father. So God's spirit does not make us slaves to be afraid, fearful. So we respect God, but he doesn't want us to behave like slaves. But he wants us to call him Abba, Father. Or listen to it from the Good News Bible. It says, for the spirit that God has given you does not make you slaves and cause you to be afraid. Into the spirit makes you God's children and by the spirit's power. So it's not something we're just making up or trying on our own effort. It's by the spirit's power. The Holy Spirit enables us to call God Father. So no longer slaves. A third related pattern would be the orphan. That is, I'm fatherless. I'm abandoned. And, you know, I don't belong. I've never been loved. No one really cares for me. So that mindset, it's very difficult to comprehend God as a loving, caring father. I'm always, I've been abandoned. Nobody really cares. And so when we say God cares for you, it's very difficult to understand that God cares for us. But we just read Romans 8.15, God wants us to be like his sons. And the same thing, Galatians 4, 4 and 5, it tells us that God has, uh, you know, in the fullness of time, he redeemed us so that we could be adopted as sons. So why did he redeem us? So we could be adopted as sons. So you see yourself as a son or a daughter of God. Not an orphan. Not as somebody abandoned. Not somebody who's fatherless. No, you are a son. You belong to his family. So let's say this. I belong to God's family. Let's say it like we mean it. I belong to God's family. I'm in the family. I'm a son. I'm a daughter. God is my father. That sense of belonging has to come. Then we can experience his love. Fourth one, the outcast. So in this mindset, we have a deep sense of rejection. We feel like, you know, it's okay for those people. They can, they can go close to God. Me, I... I I have to stand out. I can't get close to God. I, God doesn't really like me. Or I'm not welcome in his presence. I feel like your prayers are not answered. So always ask the other person to pray for me. And there's nothing wrong in asking other people to pray for you. Uh, that's okay. We need each other. But if it's coming out of this whole thought that, hey, you are closer to God. So you put in a word for me. <laughs> if it's coming out of that mindset, that's a problem. So the, this outcast mindset. Look, I, 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 I can't, I don't have access to his presence. I'm not welcome. So somebody like this finds it very difficult to understand that we are actually welcome in his presence. That God enjoys our company. He enjoys it when you come to pray. When you come to seek that, you go right in to the presence of God. It's almost like I'm outside the outer court. You know, I feel like that. I can't break in. I can't break in to the inner court. But what do the scriptures say? Ephesians 2, and I'm just referencing a few verses here. Ephesians 2, 12, 13, and 18. It says that at the time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in this world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Verse 18. For through him, we both, that is Jews and Gentiles, have access by one spirit to the Father. Say this with me. I have direct access. To the Father. Say it again. I have direct access. To the Father. 
Or let's put it like this. I have been brought near to the Father. That's what the word of God says. You who once were far off have been brought near. So the moment you say Father, where are you? Right there. In the present. Okay. Now you don't have to work your way through the outer court. Then now in the inner court. And then you come to the Holy of Holies. That was the Old Testament. It's okay to, you know, study it and understand it. But the Bible says the veil has been torn. And we have boldness to enter into the holiest. By the blood of? The moment you say Father, you need to picture yourself right there in front of him. You're not an outcast. You're right there. Father says yes. Right there. Amen? Another wrong posture that hinders us is uh, the proud elder brother or elder sister. Now, what about the proud elder brother? Or the elder sister, like, I don't know who was elder, Martha, I think. <laughs> what about them? They have no time to be loved. Love is for all the sissies, you know? I'm busy doing God's work. Busy. The elder brother, very responsible. At his job, day after day. Didn't pause to enjoy what the father had for him. Now it's not the father's fault. It's not the father's fault. But the proud elder brother or Martha didn't stop. They're just busy. They're doing the right things. I'm not saying what they're doing is wrong. They're doing the right things. But no time to enjoy the love of God. Too busy. Or maybe they say, I don't, that, that love thing and all is for APC. <laughs> Let them learn about the Father's love. I am busy. No time to enjoy the Father's love. But then what happens when people are like the proud elder brother? When the prodigals come home, they get angry. That's what happened to this elder brother over to Martha. I mean, I'm not saying Mary was a prodigal, but the people who enjoy the love of God, they get angry with them. You're not doing anything. What is this? You're saying, I enjoy the love of God. What is it? You're supposed to be busy. You're supposed to be doing something. So look at the response in Luke 15. Let's just read this. Verses 29 to 30. The prodigal, the younger brother has come home. The father is pouring out his love on the son. And the son is saying, Father, I don't deserve this. And father is pouring out his love. And look what the elder brother is saying. Verse 29. He answered and said to his father, Father, these many years, I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my what the father is saying. But as soon as the son of yours came, you devoured your livelihood, and, uh, who devoured your livelihood, how did you kill the fatted calf for him? So he's saying, you didn't even kill one goat. But father's thinking, man, it's always there. It's not my fault that you didn't pause. I mean, to eat one or two, you could have eaten ten, or how many do you want? Is that the father's fault? It's not. But the elder brother's too busy. I mean, it's very responsible. It's a good thing to be responsible. It's good to be at your, uh, do what you have to do for God. But sometimes that hinders us from enjoying the fathers because we don't have time to pause. Just receive. Enjoy what is there. Eat the fatted calf. You don't have time. Too busy. But it also makes us angry sometimes with those who are enjoying the Father's love. Just two more. 
And this is sad. Some of times people are wounded because they've gone through maybe some experiences in life where uh, people who love them fail them. So they get hurt. And then what happened? They put up their defenses emotionally. They carry pain and wound inside. And so they never let anyone love them and they will never try to love anybody else. Because, hey, this is too painful. I don't want to go down this path again. And unfortunately, this comes over in their relationship with God. God is God. He is Jehovah. Yahweh. But God, Father, love, no. I will not open up myself to that. Because what if God fails me? What if God lets me down? So let's not even go that way. So, But that hinders us from receiving the Father's love. What we need to understand is unlike people, God will not fail in his love. He cannot. God is perfect. So you can become vulnerable before God. You can open up and say, God, I'm going to trust you. I receive your love. Here's what he said, and I'll just quote one verse uh, that he told his people in the Old Testament, Jeremiah 31, verse 3, and the people were wandering away, and he said to them, I've loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. Jeremiah 31, verse 3. I've loved you with an everlasting love. Now, these people at that time were wandering away. They were messing up. They were doing wrong things. But he said, I loved you with an everlasting love. And with that love, I'm drawing you. So that love of God is everlasting. It's there today, tomorrow, always be. So you can depend. You can open up to it. The last one is somewhat funny. It's the self-critical. Their standards are so high. And so even if they have done a good job, it's 99.99. They are sad they didn't get that 0.01. They're so critical. So judgmental about they hold themselves to such a high standard. They've done a perfect job but not good enough. So they're never good enough for themselves and therefore they can never be good enough for God. Because they're very self-critical. They hold them. The standards are too high. And then, then it transfers on to other people as well sometimes. They begin to hold other people also up to that standard. And, they, uh, and, all, and, and sometimes because of them wanting to excel, be the best. God will love me only if I get first rank. So in order to get the first rank, they do all the other wrong things. Control, manipulate. Whatever, whatever, whatever. Because God will love me only if I achieve, I be the best, do the best. Only then I can earn the love of God. So the concept of being loved unconditionally, of receiving love undeservedly, of having things by grace, cannot. It's very difficult. But this is what the Bible says. Ephesians 2, 4 and 5. God who is rich in mercy because of his great love. See, because he loves you, he gives you abundant mercy. Mercy is when I fall short, I still am not feeling condemned. Because mercy makes up for that gap. I don't always have to get 100 on 100 to be loved by God. God is rich in mercy because 
of his great love even when we were dead in sins he saved us for by grace you have been saved out of his love comes mercy and grace grace gives us what we don't deserve mercy makes up for our shortfalls and it comes out of his great love so instead of being so self critical self judgmental self condemning open up and just thank him for his mercy and grace because without that none of us will make it none of us so this morning in this first message on the father's love here's what i would like us to do is just pause and think of what could be stopping us from receiving the father's what could be and I, I we just mentioned some common ones you know these seven things seven postures or mindsets uh that people generally have that we've all i think at, maybe at some point we've kind of you know been in and out of some of these but let's ask god to change it and then and discard these wrong mindsets to the prodigal god says you know while you were still a sinner i loved you I loved you and that that level and the intensity of God's love is not going to change when you're outside now you're inside he still loves us as just just the same to the slave he says even before the foundation of the world I plan to have you as my son or daughter embrace that to the orphan he said I plan for you to be adopted into my family you belong in my family to the outcast he says I plan to have you near me I want you to be so close to me I made you sit right next to me in the heavenly places in Christ you are seated there to the proud elder brother he says just receive my love pause enjoy what's yours to the wounded he says I'm too good to do you wrong I'm too gentle to harm you too perfect to let you down to the wounded yeah to the self critical says don't condemn yourself because i am not condemning you i want to close with this verse here john the beloved disciple he says this he says what marvelous love first john 3:1 from the message bible what marvelous love the father has extended to us just look at it we are called children of god that's who we really are what marvelous love the father has extended to us all we have to do is to receive that love receive it and don't let any of these wrong mindsets hinder you from experiencing the father's love amen So let's please stand to our feet. I'll just call our worship team. Let's take some time to ponder the fact that you are a son or a daughter of God, someone who's the focus of his unlimited unconditional love. Just receive that this morning. And what God wants us to have is not just like I said in the very beginning not just a uh, a knowledge a head knowledge about his love that's important we need to study but he don't stop there he wants us to experience he wants us to taste he wants us to receive and it is the holy spirit who makes the love of god real to us So spirit of God we welcome you. Holy Spirit I ask to every person here bring an experience of the father's love. God is relational. He loves and he can be loved. He loves you so you receive that love. 
he can be loved so you love him back he experiences your love he is touched by our feelings the bible says not only by the feelings of our weaknesses but even by the feelings of our expressions of love he's touched by that so when you say father i love you he's touched by that father in this place let every person even now experience being bathed in your love being clothed in your love let the love of god come down upon us in it in some tangible way flowing over every person Father, we just pray right now 
that you will dismantle in our lives, that you will break down in our lives. Those wrong mindsets, those wrong thought patterns that have kept us from enjoying and experiencing the Father's love for us. Even now, Lord, invade our lives. Your truth has been spoken. Your word has been released. And God, by the power of your spirit, tear down the lies of the enemy. Tear down those misconceptions. Tear down deceptions. Tear down even the accusations of the enemy that have crippled God's people. Lord, even now, let there be a sense of freedom. Let there be liberation. Let there be liberty coming in the hearts and lives of people, setting us free to receive your love, to receive the Father's love. Thank you, O oh God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Lord, because of your love, there is mercy. Because of your great love, there is grace. Because of your love, there is mercy. You invade our lives, you invade our circumstances, our situations, God. Let your mercy, because of your mercy, let deliverance come into the situation, the circumstances of our lives. Whatever we are facing, God, because you love us, send deliverance. Send, oh God, your work into our life situations and circumstances that need change, that need a touch of God, that need breakthrough, that need a doors to be opened, that need provision. Because of your mercy, send your interventions, Father. We thank you. We praise you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, God. Thank you. Thank you. going to go ahead and close with the benediction but I want to encourage you to just dwell upon this truth the Father's love and out of that great love there is abundant mercy abundant grace flowing to you the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with each one of us always. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also visit our website apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.